So this morning we looked uh, very briefly at this section on irony and if, if anybody has any questions now is the time to, to, ma to, to make them because I'm not going to go on with that section um, simply because the rest of it is just long citations from the Apologia which you can read as well yourself. <laughs> and once you've got the idea that this is talking about values it's not giving information, it's not telling us how the Benedictines were living, but it's trying to uh, render people more uh, conscious, to, to waken their conscience to certain monastic values. Then I think there's a key to understanding really what he's, what he's, what he's getting at. Just in the middle of page 7, at the risk of gaining an unbalanced perspective of the whole scope of Bernard's polemic, a number of passages from the, action, the section on excesses may be studied. The question that the reader must keep asking is, what value is this passage propagating? And not, what were the black monks up to? Uh, and so they're all there, and um, some of them are quite funny. You know, if you force someone to come to the office of vigils before his digestion is complete, all you will extract from him is a groan instead of a tone. <laughs> That's cantus and planctus. It's trying to render the Latin. But he's really having a lot of fun. Uh, but there is a serious purpose underneath it. So I'm not going to go on with that. Um, it's something that's relatively easy to, to read for yourself. What I'd like to do now is to move on to the main uh, subject of our our discussions and to, to look at the whole question of, of having learnt something about St. Bernard and the way that he operates, to, to move in the direction of understanding desire for God uh, in Bernard and, and the way in which he approaches it. Now, what I'm going to do in the first session this afternoon is just to, to briefly have an overview of the uh, territory that we're about to cover. And uh, then uh, in the next session we can start to cover it. <laughs> but the first thing that we have to say is that where did the question of desire for God come? In, in other words, why do we get a doctrine about desire for God in St. Bernard? And we should really know the answer from the introduction if we've studied it. Um, the main reason is that it was uh, one of the principal themes of Western spiritual writing. We find uh, references to it in, in John Cashin. We find it even in the rule of St. Benedict. There are a number of passages about desire and desire for heaven, to, to yearn after spiritual life with all the longing of one's being, which doesn't sound much like St. Benedict. <laughs> But there were enough passages there really to get the, the theme started. We find it also in Cyprian and in one of Cyprian's more well-known disciples, Augustine. And I think the first person that we have to speak about um, for about 30 seconds is St. Augustine. I don't know what, what it's like in, for French people, but uh, ask any English-speaking person for a patristic citation and the one that nearly everybody knows is one from St. Augustine, which is, You have made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. It's very interesting that this is one of the most well-known citations of the whole patrology. If you can envisage Ming on the wall and look at all those volumes and all those words of wisdom and pages of, 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 of teaching, why is it that this is the one that people seem to identify with uh, with a great deal of ease? And the most extraordinary people, I mean people who are not particularly religious, uh, find that somehow or other this particular saying mirrors their 
uh, understanding of what life is all about. And so Augustine has a great deal uh, of um, writing about the, the whole subject of our yearning for God, our desire for God, our looking forward to God. And uh, there has been a book published on this quite recently, uh, somebody's doctoral thesis. But it's, 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 it's a very, very large subject, but it was through Augustine that it became firmly fixed into the, you might say, the agenda of spiritual writing in the West. It became a very definite theme. So that, for example, when Jean Leclerc has his study of, of monastic culture, he calls it the love of learning and the desire for God. That it's a necessary part. The other principal uh, forebear of, of Bernard was Gregory the Great, who was very Augustinian in his teaching but who um, not only took over Augustine's uh, understanding, but really uh, applied it and extended it in a number of significant areas. And if we look at, for example, the uh, vocabulary of, of desire, as we find it in Bernard, we can say almost surely that, uh, that nearly everything is to be found in, in, uh, in, in the writings of Gregory. Uh, Gregory had already set out, not with the same punch, not with the same flair, somewhat more heavily and woodenly, but had set out the basic outlines of the doctrine which Bernard himself and a number of other medieval writers were to take up with so much um, delight and flair. And so this was not only a, a sort of a spiritual doctrine, but it was also a way of reading the, uh, the texts of scripture so that especially th through the glosses the scriptural glosses uh, uh, with which many of the monks became uh, familiar with the scriptures uh, the scriptures were seen as, as books of desire books which taught us to long for heaven uh, books which made us look forward to the heavenly kingdom and so forth and so uh, what we've got to do if we want to appreciate Bernard's teaching on desire, is first of all to locate it within that general area of the tradition which he received. Uh, I'm not going to do that, you'll be delighted to know, except in the most general sort of way, but just to say that, so that that's, a, uh, that's part of understanding the question. The other thing that we have to do, which is relatively technical, and we won't be spending a lot of time on it here, uh, is the whole area of understanding the vocabulary of desire. Uh, we might say, if you're familiar with the term, I can get over here, uh, talking about desire for God, to look at the semantic field don't know if you're familiar with that expression, are you, or familiar with the method itself. It's, it's a way of dealing with people like Bernard, um, who don't always use things in the same manner. But what you try and do is find out words that, although they're not exactly synonyms, but somehow or other are linked together like flowers in a daisy chain or something like that. And uh, sometimes, this looks like a chromosome or something, doesn't it? Uh, sometimes you get words that are all used together. But generally speaking, if there is a, a broad subject, you will find most of these words, and they're not necessarily all nouns or adjectives. You can find verbs in the semantic field as well, that generally occur. Or you might say, any time this subject occurs, you might have 70% of those phrases will occur in the immediate vicinity. And so that you can say, without, with somebody like Bernard, for whom style is so important, who will use a different word if it fits better into the sentence and makes a nicer sound, he repeatedly uses affectus or affexio according to the other components of the sentence. 
Uh, there's no meaning between them, not much difference in between them, but if he's just used intellectus, generally he will also use affectives, uh, simply because they fit together more closely. But the idea of a semantic field is simply that whenever a subject is being discussed, then all sorts of elements will be found to occur within it. And so, for the investigation of, of a semantic field, that you can uh, look at, look for three particular things like that, that you don't necessarily have to have all the terms all the time. And so we'll see that when we're talking about the semantic field of desire for God, that we can see with Bernard that although he talks about desire for God a lot, but there are many other terms which uh, fall into this same field, fall into the same area, are talking about the same reality. And so we can look at not only the text, we go to a concordance and say, how many times does he use desire? And then you write an article on that. But you have to extend that, and not only to the single word, which may be central or less than central, but to the whole family of associations. The scriptural texts which he used, which he always felt to be relevant, and so forth. The references, the images he used, and so forth. So what I'd like to do, just to, uh, to introduce the whole subject, because we'll be meeting all these terms when we start reading texts in various connotations, is to, is to look at just very, very briefly and lightly, and without um, looking at too many examples at this stage, uh, the vocabulary that Bernard used when he wanted to speak about desire. So the first word, obviously, is the word desiderium. You, you're going to have to learn a bit of Latin this afternoon if you don't have it already. The word desiderium, the, the common or garden word for desire. Now, um, what does desiderium mean? Oh, it means desire. What else does it mean? Well, literally, it comes from the Latin word, or it's related to the Latin basis, de esse, which means to be absent, to be lacking, to be missing out on something. So, I could say, I desire a leg because I've only got one leg. <laughs> uh, you see? <laughs> it's quite simple. It would be correct Latin to say he desires a leg, and it just simply means he's, he's missing a leg, he's lacking a leg. Uh, the basic uh, reason is, uh, the basic uh, foundation of the word is to be lacking in something, to be wanting in something. And so, you can't possibly desire that I talk to you about St. Bernard, because I'm actually doing it. Um, and you can't desire what you've already got. You can only want something if you don't have it. And this is, this is rather important, because, as we'll see uh, at the practical level, that unless you experience desire, unless you experience yourself to be lacking in something, you won't, uh, you won't desire, you won't be a man of, or woman of desires. If you go past the mirror every time and say, how are you going, sweetie? Aren't you just the greatest? Well, um, you won't have much desire because you'll be full of love and rejoicing that you've got so much that you're just the most wonderful person in the world and there is nothing lacking to me. And if anybody can say there is nothing lacking to me, I want nothing, then there's no desire. So the first element that we understand of his teaching comes simply from this experience of missing something, that I've missed out on something. Uh, someone who desires an education is someone who has missed out on an education. So, desiderium, the basic meaning, and Bernard uses it once, sermo desiderat finum. This sermon cries out for an end. It needs an end. <laughs> you know, everybody wants him to finish. Oh. And so, desiderare in a purely secular way. What else can you say about desires? Well, desires are not necessarily good or bad. Uh, they may be one or the other. You can have good desires or bad desires. You may be lacking in something. You may be lacking in some of the sins. And so you desire to commit them. 
uh, you, there are all sorts of things. Make a list of the things that you, you've never done or are not doing at the moment. And, 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 and they're lacking to you. They're not available, so you desire them. And uh, so desires are not necessarily good. But we have to say that the quality of desire is determined by its goal or determined by its object. So a good desire is a de desire which is directed towards something good. Uh, a, a bad desire is something which is directed towards something bad. An excellent desire is something which is directed towards something which is excellent. And a divine desire is desire which is directed towards something which is divine. And so, in coming to an evaluation of the role of desires, all right, we're all lacking something. Uh, we don't all have everything that we could possibly have. We may lack old age, for example. We may lack youth. <laughs> uh, we may lack um, uh, our grandparents. Um, but whether, when we desire what we lack, the quality of the desire is determined by, by the object. And the other thing about this is, is, is in, in, in per, important is that therefore the person is defined by his... I uh, don't have room for that, so I'll put that... by his desires or her desires. So you tell me what you want and that's what you are. Uh, you tell me what you're seeking in life, you tell me what you're desiring, and, uh, and uh, that tells me what sort of person you are. And if that sounds a bit like existentialist or some existentialism, that's only by accident. They say exactly the same thing. The human being defines himself by his desires. And really, it's, it's exactly um, the traditional thing. If you're somebody who desires evil things, well, in all probability, you are an evil person. If you're somebody who desires good things, or very good things, or excellent things, then you are good, very good, or excellent. So, what do you desire? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Nothing but the best. The other thing about, and, and we can see this, I mean, we could go through the texts and and explain that this is the way that Bernard uses the thing. But um, I don't want to approach things that way for the moment. The other thing about, about desiderium is, is fairly simple, and that is that it increases. In other words, that uh, although the word development in the Romance-related language, Entwicklung, uh, only came into being around the 16th century, uh, both more or less simultaneously, meaning the unrolling of, of, of a tract and so forth. There's no Latin word for development, for example. They make up all sorts of modern make-piece things like evolutio and, and, and so forth. But the notion of development is relatively modern. And so when the ancients were trying to find something to explain what we call development, how a thing remains the same yet increases in strength and becomes more and more itself, well, they, they, they found it rather difficult. But Bernard was one of these people who said that de desire increases and becomes more intense and more finely tuned as we go through life. And he was even of the similar thinking to uh, Gregory of Nyssa, with his famous notion of epictasis, whereby desire just keeps on going deeper and deeper and more and more profound, even in eternity. Gregory the Great, Bernard likewise believed that seeking and, uh, and desiring and thirsting was so important that they, things as de definitive of the human condition that even in eternity we will continue to, to seek God more, but it will imply no loss in us. Okay, that's the basic things that we find out about, um, about desiderium. We find equivalents. Uh, we find Bernard using a number of equivalent words uh, that uh, 
uh, in the same kind of way. The first is the word for love, or the various words for love. Amor, dilexio, caritas. What's the meaning of these words, and, and what's the difference between them, and, and so forth? Well, you could spend the rest of your life talking about that one. Most people say they're probably more or less the same. If any word is singled out for special attention, as being the word par excellence for uh, mystical experience, strangely enough, it's amor. When, when, when he's speaking about uh, the strong feeling of, of mystical love, he usually uses the most generic word, the most ordinary word that was used in, in, in love songs, if they happen to be written in Latin. Uh, but he uses all three interchangeably, and we sometimes, uh, we sometimes get a bit uptight about that. I remember in, in the Constitution there's something about scola dilexionis, which a number, of, a number of abbots objected very strongly to. They said it's not the scola dilexionis, it's the scola caritatis, the school of charity. It's got nothing to do with love, <laughs> it's charity. <laughs> And uh, unfortunately, I was able to show them where Bernard does speak in, in one of the diverse sermons on scola dilexionis. But he uses it interchangeably. I don't know if you... I, I, I mentioned one of my little pet hates, which is a French translation of the Second Eucharistic Prayer. Uh, remember your church throughout the world, make it grow in love. And the French has en ta charité, isn't it? which isn't the same, in your charity. Whereas both Latin and, and English and any other translation I've seen, it's make it grow in love. <laughs> uh, not in the charity, because there's a slight nuance there, I think, which is different. But generally with Bernard, these were all more or less the same. He used them interchangeably. Dilexio was a good, good word to use if you've got intellexio, because he liked to have these little things. Are more he tended to use in other circumstances, but uh, Christine Mormon has has shown that generally Amor was the one that was he seemed to uh, prefer when he spoke about uh, mystical experience. And there are other things that that um, that that you could say in human beings, not in God, although uh, he also uh, he also attributes desire for God. In human beings, these things, love is always desire. Can anybody tell me why? Why is, is, is love always desire in human beings? Yeah, because something is always lacking. Something's always wanting. You, you get what you want, and uh, I don't know if you all familiar with uh, Marilyn Monroe or not, but she used to sing a song which said, after you get what you want, you don't want it. Uh, the more you get, the more you want. You still go on hungering and thirsting and so forth. So that uh, with, uh, uh, with human beings, whenever we speak about love, the special quality that Bernard had is that this love is not an absolute. This love is something which drives us, which is conscious of its own uh, fact that it's lacking, or we might say another word for that, that it's incomplete. That it's not quite all there. The, it can't be totally happy. And th the strange thing is that he attributes this sort of love to God in, in, in one extraordinary text where he says his desire or his wanting created ours. Where does our desire come from? It comes from the fact that God uh, is incomplete because he's waiting for us. Bernard is, is great fun on this point. His sermon for all saints, he says, they're all going round in heaven with long, long faces. And do you know why? Because I'm not there. <laughs> That's what I get out of it. But that, that's what he says. They can't really be happy in heaven because they're still waiting for us to arrive. And that's why they're so interested in us. And that's why they're so interested in our welfare. But they, they can't really be happy till we're there as well. And um, 
it's 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 an idea that 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 you know is based in his belief and his devotion to the resurrection of the body. Aylward Squire says in his book Asking the Fathers that although Orthodox Christians have been reciting since the year dot that they believe in the resurrection of the body every time they say the Nicene Creed. Uh, at the same time, uh, nobody has ever, uh, ever used this as a plank of their spiritual platform since the time of Bernard of Clairvaux, for whom it was very important. So it's, it's even, he says, even the saints desire because the culmination hasn't been reached. And in an even more cheeky text, he says, well, God himself really desires that we be with him. He feels incomplete without us. And it's because of his desire of us that we experience desire. We'll come back on that one later on. But at any rate, he uses these words, uh, love, uh, dilexio caritas, amor dilexio caritas, meaning desire. And for him and we can already find this, that another aspect of love which is important for the understanding of a desire is that it's always movement. And you might say it's always outward movement. It's always ecstasy. Moving out from ourselves, ecstasis. Moving out from ourselves towards God. Totus periget in Deum plunges itself completely into God. Accusative case. Not at God, but right into him. Uh, the whole movement of love is something that, that goes out, that moves, that, 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 that doesn't just stay still and, 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 and moon in a corner and say, oh, I love God. <laughs> but it's something that really sort of drives um, a person onwards. And it's a very strong thing. The third thing I'd like to comment about the the love aspect of desire is the fact that what we have to do is separate some loves from others. All loves are outward movement, but there has to be some sort of sorting out of loves, that some loves carry us towards God, some leave us at home. And so you get the theme which we'll be looking at in, in some place, I think, the ordinatio caritatis that our loves must be progressively brought into some sort of control so that all our effective energies, all our spiritual powers are leading us towards God and not dragging us back. You know, often it's the things that when we draw our desire and our, and our loves towards inappropriate objects, well, they hold us back, they slow us back because instead of moving towards God, they're pulling us out in other directions as well. And the whole thing is they act as an anchor. And the anchor holds us back. Uh, it's an alternative, uh, uh, alternative kind of attraction. But desire, love, uh, and those, so forth, are aspects of this, a single reality. And then there are, there are all sorts of other phrases that we could, we could use as well. The affectus, or affectio, often occurs in the same semantic field, qualified by the same words, using the same images and so forth, to underline the experiential aspect of love and desire. Uh, that's the first thing. I might just write that down and put it in black. It's got two main connotations. One is experiential. The other is variety. Because he, he takes on the, the ancient philosophical distinction of all the different uh, affections or affective movements that, that change the human being. And so he talks about, about love and, and, and desire and, and so forth and uh, sadness and, as being different affectuses, different experiences in the affective order which, uh, which convey certain parts of the total reality of desire. So many of the texts that we speak about may only refer to amor and affectio and not necessarily use the word uh, desiderium in itself. There are a few more that we might just put down here for the sake of, uh, for the sake of completeness. An important one is the word intensio, as in 52.4 of the Rule of St. Benedict, 
intensio cordis, a very, very important word in Gregory the Great. Um, I thought it, when I wrote an article on that one stage, I thought it wasn't very important in, in, in Augustine, but since, I've, since then I've read a lot more of Augustine, and it's important about 50% of the time. So he has, often he uses it simply as uh, paying attention. He says it's very hard to listen, to pay attention to a lecture after, after dining on prawns and salmon. And uh, things like that, all right. He uses about half the time in that sense, and the other half he uses it more in the sense of desire for God. And, and in the in Intensio Cordis, in 52.4, uh, despite what de Vogelwey says, uh, it doesn't just mean paying attention and not going to sleep or applying oneself to prayer, but it means exactly intensio cordis is the reaching out, the reaching out of the heart to God. And it's in the Middle English mystical works like the cloud of unknowingness is used repeatedly as an expression for prayer, a naked intent, just this bare movement of the heart to God. And so intensio, not always, but in a number of important texts, actually means desire for God in Bernard. There are a few others. The word compunctio. Compunctio doesn't just mean compunction for sins. In the monastic tradition, all the way from, from Cashin uh, onwards, compunction is whatever wakes the soul up. Compunctio is a sticking a pin in people. So if I want to wake some of you up, I just come and stick a pin in you. And the thing about it, it's a very strong feeling which gives you energy. You don't feel tired anymore. <laughs> uh, you're all awake, you're all alert. And traditionally, from the time of John Cashin and Gregory the Great who followed him, and continuing into the Middle Ages, though it started to be more leaning to the side simply of sorrow for sin there, but it means also desire for God. Gregory says there are two types of compunction. Compunction of, of, uh, of fear, which makes you sorry about your sins and so forth, and the compunction of love, which makes you a little bit sad because you're not at home yet. You're not in the kingdom. Quia distat a regno, which is a phrase taken over exactly by St. Bernard, because he's still at a long distance from home. He hasn't arrived there yet. He's still, at, he's still a long, long way from home. And so he weeps and yearns and desires to go further because he feels himself to be a stranger in a foreign land. So compunctio is also a desire word. And the texts which deal with compunction are rightly looked at as texts dealing with... The other important one, and especially Bernard devotes two sermons uh, to it, sermons 80, 84 and 85 in the sermons on the Song of Song is querere, the, the idea of seeking. And it's the most moving thing that he ends this sermon, which he must have finished, 86 is the last of the sermons on the Song of Song, which is unfinished. Well, in 85 uh, and 84, that block, he says, uh, through this there is no end of seeking. Now, even in heaven, he says, we keep on seeking, we keep on penetrating uh, the reality of the mystery of God. And so almost Bernard's last thought was this idea of the search, which is one of those phrases that, in the rule of St. Benedict, which has really captured the imagination, and uh, because it expresses something that we are here. We are seekers. The nature of the human being is to seek. There are a number of other things that you could, you could say about it. Uh, seeking has a far more voluntary aspect than some other things. I mean, if you're going to look for something, you have to get out of bed. Um, you can't just stay at home. So you've, there's a voluntary an, an, uh, element about seeking, and usually the other thing that's there, it goes on for life and after life. I and mean, it's a long, long search. But that, they're the main kind of components of the semantic field. Uh, I, could, I don't want to go into the adjectives and, and nouns, but I'd like to look at some of, the, um, some of the images that Bernard uses. And particularly, the most common one is, is heat. 
so that desire makes you hot and uh, the warmth of desire, the ardour of desire, the fervour of desire. So many religious traditions talk about, about um, religious experience in terms of heat. And for Bernard, desire was the religious experience par excellence. So it's not a, an idea of being joined to God here and now, because that's something that will be realised only in the future. What we become, what is the content of mystical experience here, is above all a great longing and a great energy to go deeper and deeper to, uh, into God, uh, clo to come closer and closer to him. There's an element of incompleteness about it, no matter how, how complete it may seem at the time, it's always qualified by this sense that there's, you ain't seen nothing yet. There's a lot more um, around the corner. So heat is one of them, the ardour, the fervour, in our deshere, the heart breaks out in, 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 in flame and so forth. And again, that's all very traditional kind of language. Uh, the other one is what I might call the change in, in breathing, the change in the rate of respiration. So he talks about sighing and panting and yearning and uh, all this kind of thing, uh, the more classical 19th century type of thing, swooning, <laughs> uh, sighing for God and so forth, panting, the heart pants and so forth. Uh, thirst is a fairly common one, mainly because there are so many scriptural texts and so many Augustinian glosses on the scriptural texts which speak about thirst. My soul thirsts for God. So that's the name of my, that was my thesis actually, anima sitiens deum, the soul thirsting for God. Um, taken from Gregory the Great, but often in Bernard. Uh, that this basic uh, fact that we know about ourselves, that they are created with a longing, with a thirst, with a hunger, if you like, to put that thirst or a hunger, but hunger is less important. More important is the idea of a journey. This idea is, is, is quite popular, particularly since the council, since it wrote the eschatological nature of the pilgrim church, where everybody talks about pilgrims and Cardinal Hume's book To Be a Pilgrim. It's an image which started up in North Africa um, among the colonials there, colonial Romans, I suppose. Did Canadians think of England as home? <laughs> and, uh, yes, I suppose. The, the English side, certainly in Australia, to keep it on safe territory, they always, you know, until about the 1920s or 30s, would think of England as home, even if they were second or third generation. And this wasn't the real world here. But, you know, they were only here on exile and going back. Well, it's a similar thought in North Africa <laughs> at, at the, around the time of Cyprian and a little bit beforehand. You know, they were out on exile in the colonies and this wasn't the real world. It had none of the amenities of the real world and they, they developed uh, a notion of themselves as living in exile. And Augustine developed this, in the City of God in particular. And to understand Augustine's theory of pilgrimage, you've got to remember that he hated travelling. He really hated, he must have got seasick or something, but he really hated travelling. And um, for him it was a real terrible thing to be actually still on the journey with so many dangers and so many inconveniences and never able to be at home and never able to do anything like that. And so they take up that theme of, of journey and the other one is warfare. A very special type of warfare. Um, I'll just put war you know, which meant travelling a lot, usually on foot, being away from home, being away from the convenience of things. And the big text there was Job 7.1. Is not the whole life of the human being on earth one long military campaign? A tzaba. Uh, you know, this whole idea. But these images, now this is the thing that clinches the, the argument here. These images, both in, in nominal and, and adjectival forms, are all scattered around all these words and sometimes in the same sentences, sometimes in different combinations which means that you put this all together and you have some idea of the whole 
semantic field, if you can learn, learn that expression, the whole range of ideas that made up a very complex reality of, of Bernard's notion of desire for God. So that what we're doing is almost the opposite of Kittel. You've all used Kittel, I presume, or seen Kittel. The idea there is that you get the meaning of, of a particular word and you break it up into its, into its roots and what it actually means and you go through the word in classical Greek and rabbinic Judaism and Old Testament usage and New Testament usage and apostolic fathers and it's very much cutting down, analysing the, the word usage whereas this is trying to see it as part of a much wider whole. You'll find it in the theological dictionary of the Old Testament they've tried to introduce this type of approach a bit more. But when we start to look at texts which deal with uh, desire for God, we'll find all these components coming in repeatedly, uh, each having their own nuance, somewhat different, but all belonging to the whole. And uh, I think that if just saying that by way of beginning will enable us to, to comprehend more clearly when we start looking at texts, as we will perhaps the next session, just exactly what he what he means. Just one final remark as the way the, th the way I'm going to take the next couple of days is to look at three sections of Bernard's uh, teaching about desire for God. One is the human being which is the subject of desire. In other words, the anima. What he taught about that and how he saw uh, the uh, desire for God as being part of the definition of a human being. In other words, it's impossible to have a human being which does not have a desire for God. How this is rooted in, in nature. And this is absolutely important uh, to understand Bernard because uh, if we don't get this, we miss everything. We turn desire into an optional extra, a choice that I make. Whereas for Bernard, the thing was that desire for God is not a choice, it is pre-elective. It is part of nature. And therefore, to deny my desire for God or to work against it is to deny myself. So we'll spend a couple of sessions, a number of sessions on that. Then we'll go on to the experience of desire. And Bernard said the experience of desire is twofold. It's like trying to drive a donkey on. You have a carrot and you have a stick. On the one hand, we look forward to the good things ahead, is to look forward to God and the heaven and so forth, and that's what we want. On the other hand, we look over our shoulder and experience also some of the other reality and decide that it doesn't bring us any satisfaction and we don't want it. And so, there is an alternation. And this is the, one of the key words that Bernard and as far as I can tell, it's one of his own inventions. It's one of the, the few th original theological contributions that he makes. This idea of alternation. That our experience of God is an alternation but seeing how beautiful and attractive God is and how rotten we feel when we don't seek God. And he says it's absolutely important for us to do both things. Both to seek God and to be unfaithful. Because if we're not unfaithful, we won't realise how unhappy it makes us. So we'll come back on that. Necessa est is the word he uses. Then finally we'll, we'll start looking at the, the object of desire. God, heaven, unity of spirit, spiritual marriage, uh, heavenly kingdom and all this kind of thing. But that's just in general how we'll go. But I think at the time.